Fantastic. Well, thank you, Professor Nasruddinov, for inviting me today. I was delighted to accept your invitation, not only because I wanted to speak here today, but also because I was supposed to be at a training downtown um, covering or, or teaching um, informed consent and, um, and uh, screening questions for a survey that we're about to roll out. So I was very happy to be talking about this and not to be talking about informed consent and, and uh, much happy to be here talking about things that, that, that really, uh, really, really get me going. So, uh, so thank you for that. And it's lovely to be here. It's my first time at, at the new campus of, of, of your beautiful university. It's very, uh, very impressive. So today, given as Emil introduced, I am more of a, I guess we don't really have the concept of political science in the same way in the UK as they do in the United States, but I'm certainly a scholar of politics and international relations. Um, but as Emil said, you know, although I'm not an anthropologist today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how ethnography as a method is useful um, for us to understand uh, the particular sort of concepts that I work on, which include violent extremism, terrorism, and ultimately the sort of concept above that of security. So I'm going to draw a little bit on uh, sort of some of the uh, work that I've done uh, on uh, countering violent extremism in Tajikistan, some of the work I've done on uh, sort of transnational repression, um, so the way in which governments in Central Asia and elsewhere, Russia and Turkey, um, have targeted exiles, people who've left the country for political reasons, how they've targeted them abroad. So I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the ways in which ethnography is useful to understanding these concepts. This is building off uh, sort of the edited volume uh, that was published last year called Critical Approaches to Security in Central Asia. And given the price tag of that book, I'm happy for anyone who gives me their email to email you the electronic copy. Hopefully no one from Routledge is watching this, but, maybe, but I guess you're recording it, so I shouldn't have said that. Um, anyway, so you can cut, cut that part out. So I'll email you a copy. It's a sort of collection of essays on uh, sort of the ways in which sort of what's been called critical security studies is useful for us understanding key security issues in Central Asia. So what do you think about when you think about security? What does that mean to you? To make this interactive, I guess, why not? Maybe you haven't thought too much about it. Are you asking us? Yes. <laughs> is this supposed to be a club, right? It's supposed it's, to be interactive? I guess just uh, to put it simply, it's just stability. It's economic, uh, political, to some extent, psychological stability. Mm -hmm. So stability, yeah, that's one of the yeah, key words. Yeah. The, sure. The classic negative uh, definition, the lack of. Mm -hmm. the lack of instability. Sure. It's so it's sort of contrasted with insecurity, right? So the lack of, yeah, the lack of uh, instability, the lack of violence, the lack of conflict, right? And traditionally, when we thought about security, especially in my discipline of politics and international relations, it was very state-centric, right? We were thinking about issues of nuclear arms, arms control. The main concern, particularly during the Cold War for the United States and the Soviet Union, was the threat posed by conventional forces and, and, and effectively uh, posed by states. So what's happened with our definition of security since then and, and particularly beginning at this sort of last decade of the Cold War, is that it's been broadened, and in that I mean broadened to non-state actors who are viewed as threats, right? Now when we think about security nowadays, I think the, the conventional wisdom has obviously moved on, and you know, when you read the foreign policy documents of different governments, including you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the Russian Federation and China, you know, we're talking about what's been called non-traditional threats. We're talking about the threat of terrorist groups, we're talking about uh, the threat of um, different non-state actors. We're talking about the threats posed by migrants, for example. And my work's really been about the threats posed by a group that we don't usually focus on. Usually we think about immigrants, right? Coming to our country, stealing our jobs, right? The same similar discourse is going on in Europe, in Russia, in the United States, um, bringing terrorism to our country. But I'm, I'm really focused on immigrants, so how the countries that sending people abroad that people are fleeing effectively, um, often involuntarily. How are they thinking about populations beyond their borders? So it's broadened to multiple different threats, and it's also deepened, right? So we're, no, we're no longer just talking about protecting the state. We're talking about protecting above the state the environment, right? Environmental security. Below the state, we're talking about uh, protecting, for example, um, human security, right? Which is freedom from need, freedom from want, freedom from poverty, freedom from violence. So our definition of security has broadened and deepened. So that was sort of the first sort of step to com complexifying our view of security, at least within, within my discipline. I think people 
when they were drawing on sociology and anthropology, they were started. They would have probably come from a different starting point, right? That it's obviously security is about the individual, right? Where that, that's the main unit of analysis. And so with that's come a sort of a challenge to the very sort of ontological and epistemological nature of security itself, right? So no longer um, did scholars, well, sco some scholars still do argue that there's a sort of essential definition that's very clear what security is. Other people have come up with the concept of securitization, right? So this is viewing security as a process, right? Donald Trump is securitizing Mexican immigrants or immigrants from the South uh, Latin America by saying they, you know, and I'm not going to do an impression of Trump, but, you know, they steal our jobs, they come north, they bring crime, they bring violence, you know, they bring, you know, the uh, sort of the spillovers, negative spillovers. So this is sort of called securitization, right? So no longer is security viewed as being objective. Instead, it's sort of framed by actors called securitizing actors. Now, mostly, mostly states, but other actors as well. And then what this leads to is sort of the concept of, you know, when you call something a, 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 something a security threat, right, that means that certain acts are going to happen against it. Right? So this is the sort of idea of security being a speech act, you know, in the, in the sort of linguistic theoretical sense, and that if you call a Mexican, someone from Latin America, a, a terrorist or a, or a threat to national security, what do you end up with? The sort of extraordinary measures that we're seeing on the border. And this is obviously only in America, we're seeing similar things with Syrian refugees in Europe. So that's sort of security as process, right? That's the first or the second way we've complexified our understanding of security. I think the next way is that we've had people focus on the practices themselves, right? How is security managed? What sort of practices are being used to address security issues? And in my research, I've looked, you know, for example, at the way in which um, Tajikistan and other authoritarian states have used Interpol, right? Interpol is supposed to be this organization founded sort of in the 1920s as a, as a sort of a, a club for the world's policemen with the view to addressing sort of transnational crime. But what we've seen in recent years is Interpol being used by uh, authoritarian states to, for political purposes, even though Interpol is not supposed to be used for political purposes according to its constitution. And we've seen, you know, various cases and Tajikistan, you know, despite the fact of its small status, um, uh, has, I think, uh, something like 1% of the world's red notices uh, in circulation. So it's, uh, so it's sort of 10 times more than it has. It's, it's a sort of it, that it makes up as a, as, a pop, as a percentage of the world's population. So we even see small states like Tajikistan issuing thousands and thousands of these red notices, right, that are a request to foreign police forces to arrest someone and then extradite them and bring them home. So we've had a sort of focus on these practices. And then what I'm really going to talk about today, and I'll get to my, my main sort of point is, you know, security is something that's experienced, right? We experience insecurity potentially going to a new place. We experience insecurity, um, you know, in, in certain communities, maybe where we feel, where we feel ourselves threatened. Um, and this is really what's been called the sort of everyday turn, right? That we should focus on what Hutchinson and Crawford have called sort of security experiences. And to quote them, these are the lived realities of practical security measures, including the diverse ways in which programs, strategies, and techniques for governing security are experienced, taken up, resisted, and even augmented. Right. This really breaks with this elite bias that was traditional in the study of security. You know, what percentage of people work in what we call in the United States the blob, right? The military industrial complex. You know, a very small percent. Lots of people in the town where I live, Washington, D.C., right? That's the main thing, one of the main, main, main sources of employment. But realistically, how many people are involved in shaping these security practices that I'm talking about? Well, not very many. How many people are subject to them? You know, the vast majority of individuals. So it's really breaking with this sort of elite bias where traditionally in security studies we were looking at states, we were looking at you know, <coughs> actors like um, international development agencies uh, and other people who were involved in sort of managing security effectively. So I think it's been important to sort of do that because, you know, security is something that's experienced in our everyday, everyday lives. And so how does this help us understand Central Asia? Well, there have been a number of people who've already done some very interesting work. Uh, Aksane Ismail Berkova has written some, done some interesting work on Uzbeks, ethnic Uzbeks in, in, in Osh, right? And how do they experience sort of insecurity, particularly looking at women um, in their everyday lives? How do they adopt strategies to overcome those sort of personal security issues that they have. 
There's an interesting project as well out of the University of Bremen by Mark van Boomken, and he contributed to uh, the edited volume that I was involved in. And they, they're looking at what they call security scapes, right? So they've had case studies from the LGBTI uh, community here. And you were one of the authors? No? <laughs> yes, exactly. There you go. So you've probably talked about this before. I, I, I'm sorry I didn't recognize you. Um, and so I think in your project, and you can, you, can, you, can, you can speak to it far better than I can, but obviously I was, I, I've been following what you've been doing, and you've been working with, with Luli, right? You've been working with, 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 with Luli populations and, and with LGBTI as, as case studies, and then I think uh, some work also on the, uh, the, the Russian-speaking minority in, in, uh, in Tajikistan, in Dushanbe. And so really the focus there, and you know, I think you know, we're working in the same direction, is to sort of give, um, you know, try and give an opportunity for the stories of you know, people who are often, they're the subjects of securitization. I think that, that that's also sort of the, 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 the populations that I've been uh, working with. You know, those who've been labeled as extremists, those who've been securitized, labeled a threat. You know, how do they manage that process of being securitized? How does that affect their everyday lives and how do they cope? So in my research, uh, it's been mostly focused, as I said, on counter, countering violent extremism. And I was sort of interested, you know, when I was living in Tajikistan uh, 10 years ago, um, I was there sort of 2010 to 2013. Um, you know, this was a time in Tajikistan when there was the beginnings, well, an intensification, shall we say, of the crackdown on uh, Islam in general. We had the passing of a very restrictive religious law in 2009. We had the passing of uh, a law that prohibited under 18s from praying in the mosque. We had uh, the president saying everyone studying Islam abroad was a terrorist or a potential terrorist and should be returned. Um, and at the same time, we also had a crackdown on the Islamic Renaissance Party, which back then still had two seats in the parliament. As a sort of, uh, you know, it was obviously the, 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 the opposition side during the Civil War that had been incorporated into the, into the political system as part of the peace deal. So that was all starting to unravel, and we were seeing really a, a, an intensification of the securitization and the security practices adopted uh, against both individuals who practiced in Islam that the government didn't approve and um, individuals who were formerly member of an opposition party, the Islamic Renaissance Party. This obviously sort of culminated in 2015 with the party. Uh, being banned. And so it was really when I was working as a, as a sort of correspondent for Eurasian Net back then, and I was covering the individuals who were being forcibly shaved, having their beards forcibly shaved, you know, that I started to sort of uh, interact with people. And I became really interested in, you know, how is countering violent extremism really not about countering violent extremism? How is it really about power? Right? And so that's sort of um, what my sort of work has been on. You know, the how is how should we understand countering violent extremism, you know, not just in Tajikistan, certainly across the post-Soviet space, as uh, a way for the governments to you know, harass and crack down on opponents of all sort of varieties. And I think this is certainly, you know, um, in some ways, a sort of a Russian, or at least a Russian, Russian-led, certainly a, a sort of Russia playing a key role in, 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 in legal harmonization. So I been working on some research with a Tajik colleague where we put um, laws on extremism from Central Asia through a plagiarism checker to check how many of the articles were exactly the same as Russia that adopted the first legislation on counter-extremism. Uh, I think it was 2000 and 2002. Um, and, you know, the figures for Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan are, are like sort of in the 70, 80 percent of the text. Um, and certainly when you take the definitions, they're, they're verbatim copied from, from the Russian law. So I think the problem we have here is extremism is criminalized, right? When we, um, and when it's be, and in the way it's being criminalized in, in Central Asia and the former Soviet Union is very broad, right? Within the Tajik, well, within, within uh, most of the different laws, you know, things like uh, joining an unsanctioned protest um, and, uh, you know, all sorts of behavior has been labeled as potentially extremism. Uh, extremism, and that comes with, you know, very heavy uh, jail sentences. And so when thinking, about sort of countering violent extremism and, and power, sort of some of the work that I've done is sort of created a sort of typology of these practices um, along sort of inspired by sort of uh, Foucault's work on, on power. And so that's sort of dividing these different practices up into sort of three categories. The first is sort of the more traditional notion of power, sovereign power, right? The governments go out and like kill these people. And we've obviously had a lot of instances of individuals, you know, in my own work, you know, the head of the one of the Tajik opposition move, movements was killed in, in Istanbul 
Um, we've had ob obviously other multiple cases of, of, of this sort of very stark example of people's lives being taken, right? Lots of examples from Uzbekistan, for example. Um, so that's sort of sovereign power, the most obvious form of power. But then there's some more subtle forms of power, and the first is sort of disciplinary, right? And that's where we see individuals who are labeled extremists and they're deviating from however we've defined the norm, right? They're practicing Islam in a way that the government doesn't approve, uh, approve of their behaving in a way that, that the government deems threatening or is framed as threatening. And so, you know, the most obvious form of disciplinary power is obviously putting them in prison as a way of disciplining them. Um, <coughs> but then there are obviously more subtle uh, forms of disciplinary power. And if we're thinking, for example, of what's happening now with the return of foreign fighters from uh, Syria and Iraq to places like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, you know, they're certainly now they're going through this re-education, reintegration process where they're being sort of um, taught different ways to behave. So that's sort of disciplinary power. And then the most subtle form of power is sort of what Foucault called biopower. Right? And that's sort of not taking away life, it's framing, it, it's, it's, it's the sort of power that's targeted at the majority of the population um, and trying to frame the way they live um, and push their behavior in a certain direction that we would like them to. So within Tajikistan, this is about, and, and in some of the other countries in the region, this is about sort of what we, what I've sort of said is like sort of creating or, or um, trying to create sort of secular subjects, people that aren't attracted to extremism because they're completely anti-political, right? That, they, that they've been framed into a way of thinking that is, um, that politics is associated with um, violence as we've seen during the civil war in Tajikistan. And therefore, um, to be a good Tajik, to be a good, and to be a good, uh, to be a good Muslim under this sort of definitions that the state has uh, adopted, one has to behave in a certain way, and that's not to engage in politics. With regards to Islam, that's to dress uh, in the Tajik national way. And we've had Tajikistan two years ago now, or last year, sort of making moves towards introducing sort of codes of clothing, and that's certainly, these have been enforced for a long time at university. I remember when I was uh, visiting the, uh, uh, what was the, then this, an outlet of the state pedagogical institute in Garm, in the Rasht Valley, and I sort of had been, I think, in Tajikistan for a few months at that point. I grew a little bit of a beard, and then the person, and I was very sort of scruffy looking, um, hopefully less scruffy looking now. Um, but, uh, you know, I, the, the inspector came in and went going around the different classrooms and, you know, saw me, and he was like, what are you, what are you doing? You're not, you're, not, you're not dressed appropriately. You've got a beard. And, and so, you know, these ways in which you sort of police people's uh, outward appearance, police their behavior, and try and promote certain forms of, of living. Um, and this really has, a, has an effect on, 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 on people's daily lives. Um, I think the next sort of aspect of the research is, well, how do people react, right? So sort of taking an ethnographic approach to security involves adopting an ethnographic sensibility, right? And in adopting an ethnographic sensibility, you're trying to sort of understand these people's lives, um, what they're going through, um, and you're trying to understand the ways in which they're behaving and the ways in which they're... Uh, you know, they're trying to cope with and, 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 and potentially even resist what's going on. So again, it's a heuristic device, and I think there's certainly uh, multiple people can adopt multiple stances. Um, but within sort of my research, we've sort of, uh, and um, in, in writings with Helene Tibor, who's a professor at Nazarbayev University, we sort of divided it into three categories. So the first was sort of support. So we're interested in the ways, and this was sort of work on violent extremism. Well, why would, you know, a reasonable number of people in somewhere like Tajikistan support government policies to, um, you know, not allow their children to pray, to um, put restrictions on, on sort of outward appearance, um, you know, why, and, and to restrict education, restrict access to information, all these sort of things. You know, and I think, you know, there are multiple ways that people think, through, think this through, and there are multiple levels of support that people have, and I think it overlaps a lot with the acceptance. And so the acceptance is sort of based on, you know, ideas that, such measures are necessary, that they are acceptable, that they provide for stability, as we said. Um, and authoritarian stability is better than democratic chaos. Um, ideas of patriarchy, and I think this is interesting, and this has been sort of something that's come up uh, in the work of uh, Tilma Stavlansky, working in sort of the Pamirs of Tajikistan, um, Svetlana Torno also working on Tajikistan, and also Morgan Liu working uh, down, in, down in Osh. Um, you know, this idea of the state as a, as a family, right, and that, that analogy, and the patriarch, the head of the family, i.e. the president, you know, he knows best, 
and he you know, behaves in ways that would be in our interest. Right? Therefore, it's okay if he disciplines us because um, you know, he, he's, he's acting ultimately in our interest. Um, I think specifically in Tajikistan, we have sort of particular issues of, of fear of a return to civil war, and that continues to haunt people's, people's imagination, you know, especially the way in which the government frames any expression of, 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 of politics as uh, a potential or any sort of sign of protest as a return to 1992 when we had the outbreak of the civil war with two opposing protests uh, in two squares right in the center of, of Dushanbe. You had the government framing the Arab Spring in very much in, in similar lights. Um, and so you also have the sort of idea that st secular stability is better than sort of religious chaos. Um, and obviously governments of the region, I guess it's sort of what, what uh, Natalie Koch called disorder over the border, right? So thinking about democratization in Kyrgyzstan, you know, the fact that Kyrgyzstan is the freest country in the region by quite some margin, um, you know, that's framed in very different ways in neighboring states that say, well, Kyrgyzstan may be free, but of course it's had two revolutions, ethnic violence. Um, what's happened in the Arab Spring, that was an attempt at democratization, and what did that result in? Civil war, um, instability in Libya, instability in Yemen, right? So I think these sort of discourses um, resonate to some degree with people. But of course they don't resonate with everyone, and, and you know, I think it's been interesting in my research to look at some of the ways in which, uh, particularly people from the IRPT um, and other organizations that have been labeled extremists have attempted to sort of resist the government narratives, and so that's happened in numerous ways, particularly one way is to try and appropriate the language back, right? To say this is uh, Svetsky extremism, right? Secular extremism, right? That, 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 that what the government's doing is, is far worse than anything that, uh, that um, you know, uh, political Islamic groups could do. They're targeting, you know, tens of thousands of people are being affected by this, um, and that the government's policy itself is a better example of extremism than, uh, than, than the, uh, the uh, behavior of, of, of this opposition political party. Um, you know, there's a more extreme way one can attempt to resist, and that's joining uh, violent extremist organizations. And I won't go into sort of the work that Noah and I have been doing, um, because he probably told you about that, that last week. But, you know, that's, that's, again, adopting a sort of ethnographic sensibility to, you know, asking and trying to get the narratives. You know, it's not really true ethnography or anthropology, because we're obviously not spending time with them and following them around in their daily lives, but it's certainly you know, listening to um, the narratives of how they reached the point that they did. Um, and, you know, one of the recurrent themes probably, as he said, was, you know, this uh, uh, theme of discrimination and themes of sort of, um, you know, themes of corruption and repression and, you know, in some ways violent extremist organizations offering a, an alternative moral, sort of alternative approach to morality, a, a, a way that you could live your life in a, in a sort of more... Uh, fruitful and um, sort of, uh, sort of uh, more, more sort of socially conscious way, perverted as that sounds. It's certainly, something that, that came up in the uh, in the in the interviews and, and and some of the work that we've been doing. So I think there there are multiple multiple ways in which people can can resist these these security measures. Um, so that's some sort of some of the sort of broad ways in which ethnography has has helped me to sort of work through some of the problem sets and I. You know, I think, you know, I think it's, it's, as I say, it's a way to break with this elite bias. It's a way to bring the narratives uh, of the individuals to the fore. Um, again, which raises problems of power relationships, right? I think within, between the researcher and, and the research subjects. And I think that's something we can, we can delve into in discussions because I think that's something that I've struggled with in my own work and something that uh, I, it's, uh, especially when you're working on, uh, with individuals who've been labeled extremists, individuals who have problems with their host governments. You know, I think there's, um, there's, there's the issue of sort of that, can we speak for those individuals? And you know, to what extent um, is there a, a sort of relationship of privilege? And then the, but then there are also issues if, and I, I've done some collaborative things with, uh, with, with people, um, you know, there are issues with those individuals and then sort of the consequences of, of, of speaking out. So I think they're, they're difficult questions. Um, but I think sort of taking this ethnographic approach leads into something that I'll be talking at uh, at the Century Ocean Studies Conference next week in Washington, which is sort of ways in which sort of ethnography and, and building these relationships can help, um, can help uh, 
researchers or academics to sort of try and bridge that division or certainly to, to find fruitful ways in which they can blend, become ac academics, academics, but activists, act academics or whatever I was going to come up with. I don't know if anyone, probably someone's already come up with that, it's not, not, not that intelligent. And the ways in which they can sort of find ways to, to enact change and to try and improve the situation. Um, and I think, you know, by focusing on these individuals and their narratives and their experiences, you know, it's very much similar to the work that human rights organizations are doing, right? I think they're, they're, they're collecting data on people and, and the ways in which they've suffered. And so, you know, I found in my own research fruitful ways in which um, one can collaborate with um, organizations like Human Rights Watch organizations, um, domestic uh, NGOs working on human rights abuses and find ways to sort of collaborate and, 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 and to try and um, find ways to safely have these stories made public without endangering those um, who are the victims um, and find ways to try and put pressure on governments, although that opens up a whole another problem set. But um, I guess we can make a sort of a Q&A &A and a sort of discussion from now on because I'd like, like obviously like to hear from everyone and their, their opinions and so that was just sort of briefly how ethnography as a method has sort of helped me um, and shape my focus of, of, of my research. So, it, it, uh, two questions. The first is about the taxonomies. So, you have a you know, tripartite taxonomy in power, mm -hmm. but only a, a bipartite taxonomy in terms of people cope and adapt fundamentally to resist or to support. Depend, and then there's degrees and complexity to that. But I think acceptance as well, and sort of, I, th I think, you know, that's, I think, again, the boundaries between these are, are, are quite fluid. Um, and, you know, I think there are difficult ways to measure this, and it, as, as they say, it's just a it's sort of a heuristic. Kind of like, it's not a support in the yeah, it could be. I can't do anything anyway. Yeah, so within that, there's sort of passive, well, I guess there's, there's sort of indifference, right, and there's people, the ways in which they just don't, don't care. There's acceptance that's sort of where people are sort of trending slightly more towards the sort of the, 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 the uh, sort of support side. So I, I think it's really like a sort of, I guess you could frame it better as a sort of, as, as a sort of scale, but it's very difficult to. So the second question is, this is a bit more about theory from ethnography as applied, and the theory is mm -hmm. kind of ultimately the phenomenology of origin, right? It's mm -hmm. the focusing on the experience. Sure. So how about actually concretely, how does the methodology of ethnography inform research into securitization, as opposed to the theory of ethnography? Um, well, I think within my own research, um, you know, that involved spending time with uh, individuals who'd been labeled extremists or who were politically active, shall we say, um, in places like Russia and subsequently in Poland and sort of, you know, spending time interacting with them and, 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 and getting to know sort of how they negotiated some of those um, things like being surveilled and, and, and watched their online activity. Um, also involved before that when I could go to Tajikistan, sort of spending time um, with individuals who were uh, pious and um, looking at ways in which they were coping with um, so the additional, additional sort of security measures that were in place. And that's sort of where some of this, you know, I did find people amongst them who were accepting of this, that, you know, the government is right. Um, individual, for example, you know, a friend, someone I, I spent some time with who's, you know, who was on the opposition side during the Civil War. His brother was, um, had his leg blown off. He was quite, um, you know, or considered himself to be relatively pious. But he still supported Rachman using some of this sort of patriarchal, you know, he's, he, he led us out of the Civil War. He's the father of the nation. Therefore, anything that, you know, he's doing is probably in our, in our best interest. So, you know, I think, you know, it's been increasingly difficult to do true ethnography, um, especially given, you know, for me working in Tajikistan became uh, not a possibility anymore. So, um, so uh, you know, it's become, and certainly in the project I'm working on with Noah, sort of more sort of, as you say, sort of drawing on the sort of ideas of, of, of the, the theoretical assumptions of the validity and the usefulness, uh, the utility of sort of everyday narratives right. um, without actually spending sufficient time with, with people to, uh, to get to know them and their, their sort of behavior and take But at the end of the day, put a label on it, just a severe amount of embedded participant observation. Yeah, so that was sort of what I was uh, doing in, 
you know, in, in, in Moscow, and I was there at the sort of height, 2014, 2015, at the height of the recruitment to Syria and Iraq as well, spending some time with individuals who had been targeted by recruiters. And, and so... Um, so you would have faced then... I'm not saying any questions about that. You, you, you're, the camera would have been very built into the stick in terms of your personal security, right? Because um, you'd have both state security and recruiters. Mm-hmm. You mm -hmm. worried about you. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, that was certainly a, a consideration, um, and um, I did think somewhat about the risks of, 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 of that aspect of what I was doing, um, and didn't have any specific problems. I wasn't, I wasn't interviewing recruiters themselves. I, I spent some time with people who'd been approached by recruiters. I was spending time with people who were uh, members of, of opposition movements in Tajikistan, for example. But, um, but yeah, it was certainly, uh, there certainly are sort of risks um, and obviously um, risks as well to the, uh, to the individuals who are involved with, yeah. So I think that's, you know, that's certainly something that, you know, that, that needs to be managed. I found that working in somewhere like Russia and Moscow particularly, you know, given its sheer size, um, afforded a slightly more easier environment in that regard, in terms of the people I was spending time with, um, but um, certainly easier than, than, than Tajikistan in the village. I have a follow-up question you may or may not want to answer or cannot answer, depending on uh, anyone else wants to try. Cool. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We find out that um, community plays a great role in this. Mm -hmm. uh, security making, yeah. uh, yeah. some collective strategies, yeah. also some yeah. maybe division within community yeah. because one of members yeah. think that it's yeah. more secure than another one. Sure. sure. So, but, but it not applied, could be applied to all the cases. Yeah. For example, Russia speaking. In your case, how do how people feel about that? They uh, they identify themselves as like something not radical community of just mm -hmm. ordinary migrants that label or they have some, I don't know, resilient resistance and they think that they do have some, from somebody's point of view, that radical, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, radical views. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, so I, 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 I think I saw similar things. I think, you know, working with, for example, you know, Tajik exiles in Russia and Europe, you know, I think, it's not a, a physical community in the way that you can sort of, in, in the way that, you know, I think your research and you know, other researchers talked about, you know, geographically uh, specific and geographically concentrated communities and the way in which they can build that sort of physical, you know, geographic community. But I think there's certainly a lot of uh, a process by which there's a lot of sort of, there's a lot of social networking and there's a lot of sort of learning, you know, when, um, you know, for example, uh, the first sort of Gmail accounts are being hacked, you know, Quite a few years ago now, then the sort of there was sort of a process um, by which people were talking to each other about well, what's now the, the safe um, safe platform for communication? You know, so I think there's certainly processes of sort of learning from each other's experience, processes of solidarity, and you know, um, finding ways to uh, support and promote individuals. I think you know, in the case of, of the Tajik opposition, we've had a you know there are still divisions, but we've had a process by which there's been a certain by virtue of being targeted, you know, there's been a certain uh, coalescence around, you know, coalescence around their common, common opposition to the government and sort of the forming of, of, of certain linkages that, you know, are non-ideological linkages, they're just linkages that are based on being the target of these security measures. Um, you know, many of which, you know, once people have fled to Europe, you know, it's not, they themselves aren't really in danger, although they face surveillance and face, um, you know, some intimidation online. 
you know, it's really their families, and that's been sort of what's been called proxy repression, right? So they have families at home who have been targeted, you know, by uh, local police, state security, you know, threats of rape, um, you know, children being harassed at school, you know, all these sort of things that, are, that, that, that have a deep effect on, uh, on individuals who are, who are living abroad and a deep sense of guilt, right, that, that they, their political activities have brought harm to their family. So I think, you know, I think there are, you know, and I should address this more sort of, yeah, various sort of coping mechanisms and, and sort of community building that, that sort of find ways to work collectively to make, to try and resist what, uh, sort of, and cope with, uh, cope with what's going on. Yeah, my question is not really related maybe with uh, ethnography, but more with uh, your assessment of uh, like this process of securitization mm -hmm. in Tajikistan. Like, mm -hmm. uh, we know that it's, in general it's a very, I mean, corrupted state, yeah? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, in many, many areas, yeah? Sure. Uh, and uh, which can hardly handle any kind of proper processing of anything. And then you said that uh, uh, like it's one percent of red notices for Interpol, so there mm -hmm. has to be kind of security apparatus of trained professionals who would process this sure. and control, and then they also are able to, uh, you know, to send uh, security professionals to even you know arrest people, mm -hmm. uh, hijack them uh, to Tajikistan. Like, how does it? How does this work? Like, what does fuel this securitization? Mm -hmm. What are the mm -hmm. energies behind? Are they sure. paid better? Corruption is not uh, like within this, uh, you know, security service, or mm -hmm. why this seems to be more efficient than any other state uh, yeah. apparatus in Tajikistan. Or yeah. Is it actually state uh, efficient, or it just? Uh, um, well, I think in terms of Interpol, it's not much effort to upload red notices to the system, and you can also use something called diffusions, which is effectively. Imagine you had all the police forces in the world on your email address, like 192, 192 email addresses, and you just said, you know, we, we need to stop Edward Lem, and he's in Kyrgyzstan, and like, please arrest him. I hope you know that. Um, then you send it to everyone, right? And then they get the instant information with, with the person's face and what they're accused of. So I think, you know, um, it's not too much of a burden for them to have added yeah, so many people. Yeah, that's more, that's more difficult. And, um, you know, I, that's, always, that's been a question for me that I'm still trying to, you know, I've always thought, you know, the IRPT was always a relatively marginal force, right? I mean, I think they claimed, you know, at their maximum, their membership of about 80,000 people, right? And they claimed, you know, to have, you know, won something like, I think, 40% of the height of their support of the vote, you know? And they, 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 were, they were popular, but they were never a threat to the ruling party. And, you know, logically, you know, you would think in 2015 when the party was banned that, um, you know, that would be the end. But the ways in which the government has pursued these people, you know, through Interpol, through sending people to, uh, or at least credibly sending people to, uh, to, 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 uh, to assassinate people, you know, I think it's, 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 it's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously an overreaction. Um, and I think there's specific things going on in the, uh, within the regime itself that is dictating that. And I think, you know, it's, it's perhaps no coincidence that, uh, uh, the person who was assassinated in Istanbul had former business partner of a regime insider, the president's son-in-law, who'd fallen out and then released all this compromising information, compromat, about him, you know. So I think there's certainly dynamics of revenge going on. Um, but that is a key, a question is sort of, you know, I think the resources in a country that, you know, can't educate its people and has terrible health care, you know, a significant number of resources are being plowed into this campaign against these people who fled the country and realize they're probably not gonna be able to go back and, uh, you know, have, they, they still, I would think, m many of them still dream of coming back, but they realize that that's, that's gonna be very difficult um, and they don't pose a threat, right? So I think it's, I think you're right in saying that it's in some way a sort of, there's a cognitive dissonance between the, the threat and the reaction, right? And I think, um, but I don't have a, without, being able to do ethnography within the Tajik state, right? <laughs> within the security services, I can't, I can say rumors and things that I've heard, but I, I probably should have gone on the record with too, far too many things already today, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, certainly, uh, certainly there, uh, yeah, there, there it will be, it would be amazing if someone could do a study of sort of what's, what's, what's going on with, with that targeting, but it is disproportionate, Chris. When it comes to the electronic aspects of it, they can outsource yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. They have a ready partner <laughs> to the foreign north, 
and it often requires cost sharing, as I said in the business. Right? So in order yeah. to get the one service and the output of the service, they have to go give something back. Hence why you see a lot of tension around membership of the European Union, for instance, right? Because that's probably where a lot of the war sharing is occurring. Yeah. Um, so that is finessable if you don't have the resources yourself. Sure. And sure. what you're saying it makes sense at the top is very focused. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of yeah, I think you have lessons. you have certain personalities, and I think this is something else that you know in, in uh, Marintha Miles' work, she looks at sort of you know the, the sort of localization of sort of the things like the hijab campaign, and it turns out from her research, um, you know that um, you know individuals. It was a very targeted thing. It was individuals who had links to the IRPT. It was individuals <coughs> who had annoyed police or families that annoyed police. You know, so there is this sort of personalization um, of this sort of countering violent extremism, and I think that happens at the local level, right? Where we've seen like the mayor of Fujian doesn't like Salafis, so we've had massively disproportionate numbers of Salafis being detained there, right? Um, you haven't seen as many in other parts of the, the country. That doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means they're tolerated, right? So, um, so you know, I think that's that speaks to a broader point, which I guess is also something that. You know, we can uh, incredibly sort of account anthropology and, and maybe sociology, you know, that the state isn't unitary and the state is sort of, you know, it's better viewed as a sort of series of these assemblages or, you know, competing interests and, you know, that, uh, you know, there's just because um, this campaign's being driven by certain forces within the government and I know there are certain other forces within the government who are, you know, don't agree with our point that this, the return is not worth the investment and it, it's not achieving anything, it's in fact, you know, in, you know, main external partners don't care, the important ones, and this is damage, well, it's not really damaging relations, but it's certainly um, damaging the reputation with certain other partners. Um, well, I, I was using it as an example of sort of the, 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 the language that, you know, opposition would use to describe the government's campaign. Um, you know, I think there is the effort to, there is the effort to promote what is considered a good sort of moderate Islam, let's say Hanafi. Um, there is general, I, I don't work on issues of sort of Ismailism, but, you know, there's a general sort of tolerance, but obviously there, there isn't a sort of a state-promoted um, religion, even though it, there's no state religion, um, and there is sort of there is a minority that's sort of being passively neglected in terms of you know um, their ability to practice religion as freely. Um, you know, I would my opinion on that is, you know, I don't think I think calling either one extremism is already sort of stretching the term, and you know, I, I think you know. I don't think extremism is really a very useful concept, right? I'm, I'm interested in it from a critical perspective in terms of how it's being used. I think there's maybe a use for violent extremism if we're defining it very narrowly. And this is maybe Noah, Noah addressed this last week, but that's you know it's a struggle for project any project trying to address this issue is like getting everyone on the same page as to what what are we talking about. Um, but my opinion has always been that you know the uh, the harm or the individuals affected by the government's policies, you know, far outweighs the uh, the, the individuals who've been affected by uh, any sort of terrorist group. Uh, you know, what have we seen in, in the past few years in Tajikistan? You know, obviously the ISIS attack and then instability in the Rasht Valley, although that wasn't really credibly religiously inspired, right? So we've seen what we've seen in the same time as, you know, obviously uh, tens of thousands, well, we don't have figures, but it, certainly, certainly tens of thousands arrested on extremism charges and, you know, many others, in, thousands of individuals, tens of thousands of individuals affected by these policies of. You know, I, I was also involved with covering, you know, the individuals who come home from, in, in 2010, from studying Islam abroad, right, and they come back, and then there's, you know, there's, there were something like, I think, 3,000 of them coming from madrasas abroad, and then in the, the Islamic University in Dushanbe, which had 1,000 places that were already full, right, so they were all sort of, you know, where do we go, what do we do, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, so yeah, I, I think I don't think it's best to describe the government's policy as secular extremism. Long answer to a long answer to your question. Mm-hmm. So what was the first part of the question? Sorry, I didn't hear. In terms of the individuals I've interacted with who've been labeled. Yeah, I think, you know, I think, I think there's a, it's something that comes up. It's not really, and I haven't looked at that. I don't think I ever asked this specific question, but, um, in conversations, you know, I think, I think it came up more as a sort of, you know, you could be doing more to alleviate the situation. Um, you know, in other conversations, uh, you know, that um, we've invested, Western governments invested a lot in countering violent extremism, you know, from the civil society perspective, and we've led to this sort of securitization, militarization of these problems, and, you know, um, there is a sort of, I think there's a resistance from people I've spoken to about sort of, you know, framing it in these terms that, you know, that we're, um, we're over, over, over emphasizing the project. But I think, oh, the problem, sorry. But I think, you know, from the few conversations that I had or the few times this came up, you know, I think it's <coughs> less of a sort of America is to blame for the problem more that America could, more the West could do more. Um, you know, and I think from the perspective of sort of uh, the exiled opposition, you know, they're, they're trying to build links and they view, um, view Western actors, I guess, as a, a sort of potential partner in trying to put pressure on the government. So, uh, Emil. Yeah, um, you hear quite a lot of from the political science perspectives about the, the difference um, between Central Asian countries on how they you know, repress people right, and uh, the level of uh, repression. Um, does the ethnographic approach give um, a different view on this cross-regional um, comparison mm -hmm. um, in regards to the way that people accept or mm -hmm. resist mm -hmm. the repression. Mm -hmm. um, is there a difference between Uzbek way and Tajik way versus Kyrgyz way of mm -hmm. accepting or sure. Like, uh, sure. resisting? Sure. I guess that would be a question for for both of us, Red, and, and people who've done. I mean, I've, I've I've really mostly worked in the in in the context of Tajikistan or Tajik exiles and done some work with 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 other exiles, but um, not really. <coughs> sort of that sort of research within other Central Asian countries. Um, I think there would be, my, 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 my assumption, and, and from reading the research of people like Nina then, you know, and I think there, there are differences in each of the structural, con the, the sort of structural contexts differ, right? It's different to be in, in Uzbek in the south of Kyrgyzstan than it is to be a, you know, a, a religious individual just across the border in Tajikistan, you know, in, in Sul province, you know, I think they're both, um, you know, the, the environments within, the cultural, political environments within in which they live are, are different. So, and the, you know, again, the opportunities afforded to them by their position within, within each of those different societies maybe would affect their, their sort of opportunities, right? I think, you know, I think positionality does matter. And, um, you know, I think for uh, exiles, for example, you know, they have a different set of things that they can do, such as, you know, in the case of, you know, the tragic opposition do things like organize protests, you know, something that wouldn't be possible um, within the context of, of, of Tajikistan. So, yeah, I think certainly, certainly the options do differ. Is it only the structural factor or um, the, what, what's the role of the agency at the level of the community society? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think that also, um, yeah, I think that would also, you know, I think it's probably a, mi a mixture of, <coughs> mixture of both, you know, in terms of, in terms of stemming from that different position that they would have different, um, 
different, uh, not only opportunities, but sort of opinions on the best, or opinions on the best way to uh, resist or cope with. And so, yeah, I think, you know, I think my, my uh, research has been very site specific, definitely with the political scientists are always, how can you generalize your findings, right? And I, 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 I personally think that, you know, you can certainly draw comparisons, but um, I don't think, I don't think my research is generalizable, um, at least from this experiences perspective, right? We're working with, there are a number of people working on, on building out some of the data we've been gathering on transnational repression, right? There's a new project, Nate Schenken, out of Freedom House to build like a more global data set of people who've been targeted by Interpol, right? From the sort of practices perspective, I think you can sort of uh, more easily draw comparisons uh, between securitizing discourses, right? Similarities and difference, but it takes, I guess you need a, a you need a large team to sort of, you know, spend time in Africa and look at these issues or spend time in lots of different countries. And so I guess Nina's project's been more comparative and things than mine, but, uh, but uh, yeah, that would be, uh, but no, I think you're definitely right that it's a mixture of both agency and, and, and structure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you already talked about the ethnographic approach like it must have been quite hard to just really extract the honest opinion from mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm from the least now myself. So I, I understand what you're talking about. Like people are not really honest with their opinion. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Must have been a really uh, big challenge. Sure. <laughs> to really sure. That yeah. Opinion. I mean, would you consider that as a shortcoming? Yeah, I, I think that's I, as with any sort of you know, I spent two and a half years in the country and so managed to build some of these relationships over time. But I think it is, you know, there are certain, you know, there's obviously the restrictions and the effect of my, my sort of person, you know, being from where I am and being an outsider. And, you know, so I think that's, you know, that's where, um, that's certainly one of the challenges, my gender, you know, that's you know, very difficult to uh, speak to women, particularly in, in, the, in the village where I was. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think that's definitely, I guess that's the restriction with any, um, anthropological or ethnographic approach, right, that it's going to be, you know, and that's why it's sort of, I think it's, it was easier in some ways uh, to speak to people in places like Moscow where people maybe felt themselves a little freer, maybe from some of the constraints of, you know, there's a lot of, as you know, sort of community level sort of surveillance and watching and, and people, people, um, as you say, it's, it's, it's impossible, right, to, to know you know, you can, you can try and build a relationship of trust and try and sort of um, get to people's <coughs> experiences and feelings, but ultimately, you know, that's uh, something, you know, where, you, where obviously there's a possibility that they're not expressing themselves fully or that they're manipulating you and things, but it's, um, yeah, I feel like, I feel like the further, the further away I've gone from the communities themselves, then people are maybe uh, able to express themselves a little bit more freely, but then they themselves are further away from some of the problems that they're, you know, that they're addressing. So I think it's um, it's uh, a challenge for for everyone. Um, thank you very much, Edward. Yeah, thank you. That was great.